Greetings, programs, and welcome to another episode of the Awesome Friday Movie Podcast, which I'm introducing in my late-night sexy radio voice for some reason. This week, we're speaking about two new movies, uh, Netflix's new heist film, Army of Thieves, and the blockbuster release, Dune, from Canadian director Denis Villeneuve. Uh, my name is Matthew, I'm here with Simon, and as always, how are you, Simon? Wait, no, wait, let me guess. I'm tired. I think... We're using our late night midnight caller voices because it is indeed late night here. It's nighttime in the city, and as we know in Vancouver, like any other city, night is when the spirits come out to play. So maybe we'll attract <laughs> some tonight. Maybe we'll attract some spirits in our discussion of two pieces of media that have been released this week. <laughs> I've always <laughs> wanted to do like erotic narration. So, um, uh, yeah, you can well, go mission, retired. Mission accomplished, sir. I've got the right accent for it. Come on, let's face it. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm still, we're moving in two days. I'm physically and mentally exhausted after sorting out the shit from our bank. Pro tip, listeners, don't get a mortgage through a bank. Go through a mortgage broker. Okay, end of that story. Good. Anyway. Mortgage brokers are not a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But anyway, I'm I'm okay. As a result, uh, I'm going to be asking lots of questions today because I haven't watched anything that we're about to talk about. I tried. I really tried. I believe me, I did. Yeah. But um, when I, mean, I once tell you're you, once you're fully moved, I feel like there's yeah. a much higher chance that there'll be fewer episodes of the show that aren't just the <laughs> Simon interviews Matt about a movie show. I I kind of like Simon interviews Matt about stuff because I like asking you questions. You're much better at talking about stuff than I am anyway. So it just seems I... be better to listen and ask questions. I will say that I appreciate that sentiment, but I fully disagree with your thesis, sir. <laughs> I've heard your interviews. I'm so glad I'm not the person who does interviews on Awesome Friday. You ask, like, <laughs> like you, ask, you get to speak to all these really cool directors and you ask really insightful questions that aren't kind of sycophantic at all. They're really, everyone's really into it. And if it would be, it'd be like, so, so you make movies, hey? Um, <laughs> movies, I've watched movies. What, can you tell me what is your favorite movie? <laughs> Tell me, I'm sound like Morty. Tell me, tell me about this movie. What happens in your movie? <laughs> and you're like, so uh, I noticed in uh, one of your shots references, if the black and white film Les Amis du Pauvoir, uh, released, of course, by Francis Bouffard, and the director's like, <laughs> yeah, man, no one's, no one's noticed that. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we really tried to work that in. Nice one. So, yeah, you're, you're doing the interviews. It's fine. Yeah, well... To be fair, I'm kind of I'm also completely overbooked at the moment, and I am technically double booked with um, two different film festivals for this weekend mm -hmm. that I neither of which I have time for, but both of which I'm going to try and make time for. And I'm God, imagine to... if you were being paid for this kind of quality you're making. Imagine that. That's true. That would be amazing if someone say <laughs> went to Patreon.com/slash oh, Simpson and subscribed. $5. If twenty people gave you five dollars a month, you would have a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired. No, I just like to some... just like to point out that Simon's wife is the does the math and the finances in his household. <laughs> oh my god! It's funny. We've had lots of mortgage meetings, mm -hmm. and I'm like, "What's the cartoon where there's like?" There's three boys in a trench coat trying to get into a bar all the time. And everyone believes that they're a businessman because they're talking mm -hmm. business, business, business. That's me in a mortgage meeting. Yes, yes. Numbers, advertisation rates. Very <laughs> interesting. That's like in uh, uh, BoJack Horseman. What the, oh, uh, I can't remember her name because I didn't watch all of that show because I'm a silly person. But uh, the, the Princess Kitty or whatever her name is dates, mm -hmm. a, dates a guy who was just three kids in a trench coat well, for a that's while. That's probably what I'm thinking of. I watched the whole of season one of Bojack when I was sick, and I'm not sure that was the best move because I got to the end of season one and I was like, that was amazing. What an amazing like, show about being sad. Like, that's really, what a great show about mistakes and regrets. Then I immediately started season two and I'm like, nope, don't want any more of this <laughs> ever again. Mm -hmm. So I didn't watch any more. Yeah, it just fell by the wayside for me because I'm a silly person. Uh -huh. uh, well, well, anyway, 
Let's now that we've now that we've suitably, <laughs> suitably bantered, uh, Frank, before we dive into either of these films that you haven't watched, um, I have a question for you. So one Ooh. of the next big releases from Netflix is going to be their live action adaptation of Cowboy Bebop, which is, yes. I would argue, one of the best anime shows of all time which and i support this argument by saying it's one of the only anime shows i've ever been able to watch in its entirety like it's kept me interested the whole way through and it's 26 episodes in a movie and every single one of them is great but uh, you haven't seen any of it have you i think you sorry. have my dvds from like a decade ago <laughs> I... No, but I do have your very limited edition clavo in driving short films Oh, that's you can't right. Get anywhere. I have that. I don't have your Cowboy Bebop. I'm afraid. I oh, do have I Clone Wars. I've got. I've got your entire Clone Wars collection, which I've had for about twelve years. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, um, so my I, question I, is, I bought, yeah. My question is, how do you feel about this show? How do you feel about this so, show? Have you? Are you excited or not? The trailers, so purely based on the two trailers, my reaction is, as I texted you earlier this week, my reaction is. I don't know if this is good because it's clearly made it, lots of people who love the show are very excited about the trailers and the tr the first sort of concept trailer where they are moving the swipe screen across they're moving the comic book panels yeah just yeah. amazing just those swipes and playing with the swipes that was pretty fucking great to be fair yep. the second trailer so the main trailer I watched today the, the story trailer uh, I I really like dynamic, bright, funny, weird sci-fi. Like I I really like it. But what I got from the trailer was this kind of awkward. Like it would the cut in the trailer was actually really weirdly slow. I found um, your your man uh, of God, oh, John 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 Cho John Cho. I found his delivery of the lines really flat like super flat and I'm like is this what spike is meant to be like like shouldn't it be a bit more like cheeky and maybe a bit more dynamic but well, one of the interesting oh. one of the interesting things about the the animated show is that it's actually kind of down downbeat like mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the music is amazing jazz and the 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 world building is impeccable and the characterizations are great and mm -hmm. uh, te the technology on display like in terms of the like created technology within the world is incredible but it is like a downbeat noir throwback disguised mm -hmm. as a disguised as a western disguised as a show about bounty hunters in 200 years <laughs> like right so um my thing is that i i really like the animated show and i'm asking you because you haven't seen it but i really like yeah. the animated show and i'm worried i'm worried about the live action one because i really want to love it so i was just curious what your reaction was i, I think that yeah no i think my huge advantage is that i haven't seen the show so when i watch the live action one i have nothing in my head it's going to be the same like when i watch dune i've never read dune i've never seen any of the versions of dune i have no idea i know that there's a giant worm with like an anus for a mouth and at one point some guy has blue sparkly eyes which is significant and that's that's all i know and so uh -huh. I've, i'm gonna go in like the ignorance of a child in both these things and have nothing in my head. Like I saw a very uh, in-depth TikTok today about how the, t the computers in Dune are wrong because there's no visible computers. There's technology, but no computers. I'm like, this is clearly something that's not going to bother me because I've got nothing. I haven't, it's not like Lord of the Rings. Like I haven't wait, read wait, wait. this. Wait, sorry. What was the, this person's argument? <laughs> so as I turned it off because I'm like, I'm not listening to this shit, but it was it was a very intense man saying that he was very angry that there was technology on display but no visible computers on display like actual. Oh, okay, okay. So computers. let's let's put a pin in this for a moment because <laughs> we're going to talk about Dune second on this show because I feel like we okay. need to get into further depth. But okay. I can say, if you saw a TikTok about a man complaining that there was technology <laughs> on display but no computers, mm -hmm. this person has never read dune before <laughs> okay because I that think... is like 100 percent the point but anyway yeah. that's that's good i mean either way it was not an argument i was willing to give my uh, any of my time to so um 
uh, I don't know. I, I just want my films to be exciting and well cut and dynamic and creative and interesting. And same with TV shows, like anything. Uh, um, the most recent show I watched was Squid Game and it helped me. I had I went in thinking it was going to be quite an exploitative kind of battle royale, remember, as in the, the Japanese movie mm-hmm. Battle Royale. And I don't know how far through you are now, but what I got was this amazingly devastating human drama about debt and about like working yourself into a hole and, and the and the choices we make and i love sweet game i thought it was amazing brilliantly made brilliantly shot and that soundtrack was just exceptional yeah well let's but, um let's put a pin <laughs> back in this because we are going to yeah. talk about doing it a bit in the meantime okay. let's uh, dive into our discussion of the army of thieves which is a prequel to Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead, starring and directed by Matthias Schwieghofer. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, I, I chronically. Know, I'm, I'm, I Sorry, know. go ahead. No, I'm just laughing that um, when you mentioned it's a prequel to Army of the Dead, yeah. which we, we know about. And so, of course, when the zombie bits pop up, it's like, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's all tied into the world. To let me tell you, my wife was so confused <laughs> at watching this heist movie, and then there's like a, a flash of a zombie apocalypse, and she's like, "What is going on?" So, yeah. What happens in this TV show? Uh, so in this film, the the most oh, fun character stuff. from Army of the Dead, Ludwig Dieter, safe cracker extraordinaire. This uh, this story, this movie tells his early story when he first becomes a safe cracking criminal mastermind uh he's working for a bank and he's recruited to an international team of thieves and they go on a spree where they rob a series of impenetrable vaults um because they want to be legends and it is i don't even have to tell you anything else this movie is exactly the movie you think it is and that is not a complaint from me Mm -hmm. i this movie's shallow it's kind of dumb it wears Ooh. its references on its sleeve, like very much so, and, mm-hmm. but it's just well put together enough, and the cast is just charismatic enough that I enjoyed it. It was exactly the kind of low-key BS that I wanted when I watched it. Mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, you're completely right. You're like This character is delightful, right? and it's played very beautifully. He is the standout character in Army of the Dead, and it was the right choice to give him his own movie, yeah. Uh, because he's he's very kind of Euro Germanic, and he's um, his delivery in English is actually absolutely spot on. He like he treads that thin line between um, being very Germanic, but also using English the right way to tell humor, which is really tricky for a non-native speaker, as we saw in Squid Game. <laughs> but less about the VIPs, the better. The thing I I felt in what I maybe I don't know. Maybe it's fair because I haven't seen all of it. But oh, sorry, it's on my phone. Surprised at how kind of bland I felt the whole experience was. I kind of wished the safe cracking and the heist had been the star, and that the everything, all the interpersonal relationships. And the dynamics between, like, the crew mm-hmm. didn't work for me at all. Like, I found it quite boring. Him cracking safes, I would just watch an hour and a half of him with his head up against a piece of metal. And they did the, a very clever sort of CGI of these cogs clicking to represent what he could hear. And he's, yeah. he, uh, there's the, the, a great bit at the beginning where he's, he has to prove his metal at this safe cracking competition and... The, the, yeah. under, the underground safe cracking competition so at the beginning of this movie is the most ridiculous, but maybe the best part of the whole movie. If you mention so when, Fight Club, but safe cracking. Yeah, he's like lured, like he's lured to this place to 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 prove his stuff as a safe cracker because he hasn't done any real safe cracking in his life at this point, and he goes to this place, and it's literally like in any other movie, this would have been like an underground Fight Club with rich people <laughs> betting on burly men, but instead it's like this underground safe cracking club with like you know there's a hot girl safe cracker and there's a rock star safe cracker who like gets upset when he gets beat like it is the weirdest thing there's a, so there's a woman with crazy hair who's announcing everything that's going on like it is yeah. the weirdest 
but somehow it's maybe like, the yeah. best part of the movie. <laughs> like, oh, it is absolutely. And and the nice thing is is that he um he does what's the character's name again? Remind me. Uh, uh, so in this movie, he's still called he's Sebastian, and he he right. later changes it to Ludwig Dieter, but he's Sebastian through for this movie. Right. Okay. He doesn't really know what's going on, and so no, he has no idea. He, it's it's just. It's kind of a bit like watching Mr. Bean at a safe cracking convention. Like he uh, he stumbles his <laughs> way through, and he all of these other safe tracker safe crackers are like these uber cool like hackers, like generic hacker types. And then there's him, and the and, and then of course it comes down to him versus the rock star. And the the way they choose to do that final safe crack is actually really satisfying. Like it's yeah. really really good. And I kind of wish the rest of the movie had been like that, like really, really good, more focus on the highest, more focus on his sort of personality. I like him and um, the girl, uh, uh, Natalie Emmanuel, was, yeah. was fine. I was going to say that I sort of agree with you about the crew interdynamics, except for that I thought him and Natalie Emmanuel were quite good. Mm-hmm. And I actually thought that the other girl was pretty good too. Uh, mm-hmm. Her name is... Lucy Fox, I think, in real no, life. Where, where have I seen her before? Because that was driving me crazy. I haven't Googled her yet. But I've definitely seen her in something quite recently. Uh, I don't know. It's fine. I can Google. But, the you know, it could have been him and Natalie Emmanuel and the other girl. And I think that would have been far stronger than tying in the bearded guy, tying in the British guy. Uh, and then adding in that weird kind of double cross with him as well. And it kind of just slowed everything down. Yeah. I mean, part of this, part of the movie's sort of issue is that it is a little bit formulaic and a little bit repetitive. Like if you've, and even I think to its credit, I think that, um, uh, Schwighofer and the guy who wrote it, a person called Shay Hutton, um, know that because there's a scene early on when he's first recruited to this team of international thieves where he says wait is this like a movie film where a team of professionals come together and the only the complementary skill set can pull off these daring heists when they work together and someone's like yeah that's exactly what's happening <laughs> so I mean, like all, i think i think it knows a bit like it's a bit like breaking the, the fourth wall all the way through isn't it and that's why he works so well because he's like a kid yeah, I was going to say, his childlike sense of wonder is what yeah. makes, at everything, is what makes yeah. the film work. And yeah, I think right. that, to her credit, Natalie Emmanuel's portrayal of this uh, Gwendolyn character, who's like the, 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 she's the thief in the crew, right? Um, she's mm. the pickpocket and the brains. And I think that her responding to him, basically, who's now, he's in it because he wants to, you know, crack these three legendary safes, not because he necessarily mm-hmm. wants the money. He wants to be a legend, and so does she. And mm-hmm. I think that that stuff all pays off pretty well. I think this movie's hamstrung a little bit by the fact that it's a prequel to Army of the Dead. Like, it definitely has to end in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it does leave it a little bit open that if they wanted to do another one of these, it's set far enough ahead of Army of the Dead, they probably could. Um, mm-hmm. But it does, I kind of, like... I would much rather watch three more of this than mm-hmm. than more of Army of the Dead. So, because yeah. like well, again, it's... it's a little bit repetitive and it's a little bit shallow, but also it's exactly what I wanted it to be. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> you know, it's enough. it's dumb Ocean's Eleven, and I'm fine with that. It's, yeah, it very much is dumb Ocean's Eleven. I wish it had been more Ocean's Eleven than the other stuff that they tied in to be honest i think if we do get a sequel my hope is that they they look at it and they work out what does work and what doesn't and really double down on the ridiculous heist aspect because that's the most beautiful thing about oceans 11 and 13 is the 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 moment where the heist gets pulled like what you see all the planning and all the things that go wrong on the way and then that the heist actually happening like dominoes and they kind of went down that that route this way with the three like rock say like mozart safes like the the best safes in the world i thought that was a great idea oh yeah the the wagner's ring cycle of safes yeah yeah and the fact that he he got excited that they were named after the ring cycle 
was, yeah. was just lovely. I mean, there's lots, lots of nice moments in there. Definitely I mean, enough that they should make another one. I would say that, you know, each of the three heists plays out like a high, like it's almost, it's basically like it's three mini heist movies mm-hmm. and each one plays out a little bit differently. One of them obviously has a double cross in it mm-hmm. and each of them, each of them has their own misdirect. I think my favorite of the three might be the first one, which yeah. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's too bad of a spoiler to say that like they drive up to the bank and then someone narrates the plan as we get to watch what's oh, quote yeah. supposed to happen <laughs> like in any other movie. And then Sebastian's like, it can't be that easy. And they're like, we're already done. And he's holding a bag of money. Like it doesn't even <laughs> pretend to to do the thing where it's like, the, it misdirects by actually doing it right and easy instead of like having any kind yeah. of complication. And I really, I really liked that. Yeah. There's a couple of moments where he kind of breaks the fourth wall indirectly and it's, it works every time. And it's, um, it, it's again, how he plays this character in such a funny and delicate way. And he's so innocent. You can't help but root for him and feel for him when he gets double-crossed. Yeah, honestly, my question about this movie um, and Army of the Dead, to be fair, is how come we haven't really seen Matthias Schwieghofer before? Like, I, I feel like he's a pretty dynamic and fun performer, but I don't know. He hasn't really been in much stuff that I would have... You know, not 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 much America. He hasn't broken big in America. I guess is what I'm trying to say. I I mean, I I definitely recognized him when I saw him in Army of Thieves. So I've definitely seen him in something. Wow, he's done a lot. Yeah, he's been super active in wow. German cinema. He even played the Red Baron at one point. Um, but like again, yeah. he hasn't really had a chance to really have that moment where he breaks big, like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he's had he's had it now because it was Army of Army of the Dead, right? You know, mm-hmm. he plays a supporting character. He's the breakout character. He's probably going to get a lot of work now, and I'm glad that he's here. But it's just interesting to me that it took this long because he's fun. He's so much fun. Oh, he's in Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. Have you seen that? Yes. In 2008. Oh yeah, not not impressed. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's a whole other episode. We could do a whole episode <laughs> on Valkyrie. I don't um, dislike that movie. I think there's just a lot to talk about when you talk about Valkyrie. Right, okay, I haven't seen it, so okay. Yeah. Yeah, but he's great. Hopefully this does lead to um, more opportunities for him to act in English, because it turns out he's really good at it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I would, I would like you, know, I'd watch a couple of more movies of him just being really happy about safe, safes and safe cracking and being really angry with people when they try and rush him. Because yeah. it's so delicate, right? Is it weird that I I kind of really appreciated the whole like safes as art aspect of the film? Mm-hmm. Where, no, like, I think this, that's not really well. Yeah. Like the you know this old man created four th- four safes yeah. named after the ring cycle, and they were his magnum opus, and then he killed himself, so no one could learn his secrets. And like, it's yeah. so ridiculous, but it's also <laughs> so perfect for this kind of movie. Yeah. And it's one of the few things that I think carries into Army of the Dead really well. Because like mm-hmm. the the safe they crack in mm-hmm. Army of the Dead is the fourth safe in the ring cycle. And the Gotterdammerung, which was, you know, in this movie, no one knows where it is. So um, uh-huh. it's uh, it does tie in kind of nicely that way. But mm-hmm. it's, uh, I don't know, man, like this movie's not smart. <laughs> but it's just smart enough to know exactly what it needs to be, and I I enjoyed it as a result. Fair enough. You know, I could have a... done without. Honestly, I could have done without the double cross. It kind of lost me there. I yeah, I just saw it coming from so far away. Where I was like, like as soon as he called out again with that, like, oh, is this the kind of thing they like in a movie film where this happens? Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, so this is what this movie's gonna be like, and yeah. I'm fine with it. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But so did you like it then? then? Did you like um, it then? That's my question. I, I I didn't like it as much as I thought I would. I thought it would be a bit more snappy, a bit faster in pace, a bit more dynamic, a bit more based on the heist. I didn't give two shits about everyone else in the crew apart from him and the two girls, to be honest. Yeah. And I'd, and and so whenever it cuts to any of their shit, like the the guy, the bearded guy, Brad Cage didn't like i didn't like that character i know you're not meant to like the character but it didn't do anything for me that advanced the story in an interesting way so his whole relationship with uh natalie's character the double cross his pressuring her to do stuff i just didn't care at all about any of that it's not what i wanted from this movie at all 
It is definitely fleshed out a little more in the back half, but all of the characters, pretty much all of the characters except for Sebastian and Gwendolyn, Nathalie Manuel, um, mm-hmm. they're they're all just archetypes. And yeah. knowing that going from like the first moment you see them, I was like, okay, I know what kind yeah. of movie this is, and I'm fine with yeah. it. Yeah, that's fine. Like I'm not saying I loved it. I'm saying that I enjoyed it and I have no regrets. You know, <laughs> like it's a pretty solid three out of five, and mm-hmm. I'm fine with that. I mean, it says a lot that we are both saying we would watch another one. I would watch another safe cracking movie with this dude in it, like without oh, yeah. any problem 100%. at all. And you know what? I'd watch. I'd watch another Army of the Dead as well if he was in it. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. Okay. Oh well. So that's very so, much that movie. And yes. uh, I think we're saying, you know, your mileage may vary, yeah. but we basically liked it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Why not? Good. <laughs> well, let's dive into then the latest adaptation of the seminal work of science fiction that is Dune. Uh, first published in 1964. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> famously adapted into a film by David Lynch in the early 80s and into a miniseries by the Sci Fi Channel um, in. Uh, the year 2000 i believe is that the and sting version like or is that the, stings is in the there? sting is in the david lynch one. Oh, okay he plays fade for who's a, oh yeah i mean a, ba- a bad guy yeah okay uh and now adapted by denny villeneuve who's i think you know proved himself a very excellent director over the past several mm-hmm. years helming things like sicario and prisoners awesome. and blade runner 2049 and now Dune. And you haven't watched this at all, have you? Well, the thing with Dune is I, I know nothing. I haven't seen it. I don't know anything about the story. I don't know anything about the books. All I keep hearing is that Dune is like this this monolith of sci-fi that everything else basically comes from. And it's the reason Star Wars had a desert and... It's a reason Tremors has worms, <laughs> or maybe not Tremors. But no, the, actually, um... Tremors as well. Like, oh, okay. So, what so was the... it? My question is like, before you tell me the story, like without spoilers or, or whatever, what is it that has made it so important? Is it is it just because it got there first, or what is it about Dune that has made it this epic that has seemed to have lasted, criti- or, or like withheld its criticism throughout all these years? Uh, so this is a big question, <laughs> um, yes. but the, when the, the, the book itself is kind of like Lord of the Rings in that in a certain type of science fiction, it was definitely maybe not the first, but definitely the first really excellently executed version of it itself, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, and introduced just a ton of of interesting concepts and the world building in the, in the story, the world created in the books is one that is both a weird far flung future and also somehow inspired by our recent to distant past. It's a world set uh, 20,000 years in the future. There's no computers, but we have space travel, you know, that we achieve space travel by people getting really high you know, like it's, uh, it's, and it's well, weird. Like... It's, uh, I'll explain in a minute. Um, okay. In terms of its influence, it's a book that I, it's one of those things where like, you know how, uh, you know, George Lucas wanted to get Tintin and ended up making Indiana Jones, right? It's one of those things that everyone watched, everyone read, and it became a thing that just influenced everything else. This was actually heightened by, there's an, um, an art, an art, a auteur director named Jodorowsky, who is contracted. He actually bought the rights to make a film out of Dune in the seventies, the early seventies, and he spent years in pre-production on a filmed version of Dune. And when the studio came to check up on him, he had a script that quote looked like a phone book for a fourteen-hour version of the movie, and he'd done thousands of storyboards and thousands of pieces of concept art and this this version of the movie was famously never made there's a really interesting documentary about this version of the movie never having been made but the the really interesting thing is that like all these storyboards and all this concept art and all this work that he put into it 
was never destroyed and it ended up going on to be seen by other people at these film studios and from there we end up with tremors and we end up with star wars being on a desert planet and we end up with you know the big evil monster in beetlejuice being a sandworm and we end up with like it just went on to influence so many other things it's just sort of you can't even name them all they're so pervasive and it's just sort of been a it got there first and b it was in the right place in the right time and it also went on to be like it was well received enough that frank herbert wrote six books all of which are considered pretty much classic well the first four i would argue are classics and the the last two are also super good (laughs) sorry i don't want to assume but have you read the book have you read the original i've read all six of the originals yes okay so they're they're classics and highly regarded but are they good yeah they really are good reads yeah they are the thing about dune especially the first one especially is that it's quite dense uh and i think the reason the reason famously the the reason that the david lynch version is so maligned is that you know that's a two and a half hour movie or so that the studio took away from him and cut down to two hours from his original five hour cut like this is a a thick dense book uh there's just so much going on and the only way there's no good way to adapt it into one film which is why this new version only really adapts the first maybe 40 percent of the book why is there no good way to adapt the book it's it's just too much it's just it's just too much like there's is it like politics heavy or or like action or too much too many characters yep it's a sprawling epic like it's Mm -hmm. there's no other way to describe it but epic there's a cast of thousands it concerns the political imaginations of an entire empire along with the political imaginations of uh, an entire culture of people on a specific planet also while building this super interesting future world where there's people divided up into imperial houses and classes and uh, you know it's there's there's i can't, can't even explain it all there's so much going on and so this version denny villeneuve's version only adapts about the first 40% 40% of the story, if that. Wow. And I think that that was a good choice. <laughs> um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the source material, if you watch the six-hour miniseries version of Dune from the year 2000, this movie ends around the same point as the first episode of that ends. So that oh, that's a... Yeah. Is is there a is there a, a point in the book where it very clearly like changes narrative track or something? Why why is how did the movie decide where to end? There's a so there's a couple of places. I had a couple of thoughts about where it might end when I was going into this film, and it went with my f- sort of around what I would say was my first guess, which is again around the forty percent mark. There's a pretty natural spot to stop. Um, to give you an idea of the plot, so here, let's just give you a breakdown of the plot. Basically, it's the year 10,191, which I don't think a lot of people really realize is also not AD. It's like after the Spacing Guild, it's actually 20,000 years in the future. Right. Um, uh, Timothy Chalamet is Paul Atreides. He's the young son of Duke Leto Atreides. They are one of the great houses of the universe. It's a feudal system. There's an emperor and other houses. The main antagonistic house is called House Harkonnen, um, which is ruled by a gluttonous fat man called Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. And at the start of the story, the emperor has decreed that the Harkonnens must give up this planet, Arrakis, Dune, and give it to the Atreides because of their, supposedly because of the Harkonnens' poor stewardship of the planet. Uh, the planet is home to, is the only place where a very specific commodity can be mined. It's called the spice. Um, and so it's the most important planet in the world because the spice um, grants long life. It grants expanded consciousness. And most importantly, it enables interstellar travel. <laughs> okay. Is that ever defined how? Or is it one of just one of these things? Oh yeah, it does. it does this thing. That's in the book, yes. In the in this movie, no. Right. Um, 
So the whole the whole setup to the book is basically House Atreides moving to Arrakis and taking over control and trying to deal with all the booby traps and sabotage that House Harkonnen has left behind. Um, in the narrative, this is all a setup for a double cross. The problem is that Leto Atreides, Paul's father, is super popular and the Emperor is jealous, so he's actually setting him up to fail so he can then, the Harkonnens can then swoop, swoop in and, and decimate them and destroy them. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that. Um, this movie ends right around the time that that double cross happens. The problem with oh. the book that I have is that everything interesting in the book happens after that. <laughs> ah. Like literally, so, this movie this movie ends after the setup portion of the book. <laughs> so does it feel like that? Does it feel like an incomplete movie or like a trailer for the next part? Yeah, to me it does very much so. Oh, that's a shame. To the, to the point where there's a character right at the end of this movie, a character basically looks at the screen and says, "This is only the beginning, you know." And it took all my bites <laughs> and it took like all my willpower not to be like, "Fuck you." <laughs> and to be fair, so I. I wrote a review of this this movie and I only published it a couple of days ago because I was stewing on it for a long time. And to be fair, I feel like so now that it's done a bit of business, a second movie has been greenlit. So we are going to get the second half of this story, which I think is good. I have no idea why this wasn't just filmed all at once. You know, like oh, Lord of the Rings style or or Matrix uh, sequel fashion. Like, there's no reason for them not to have done that in today's climate of ongoing franchise, right? But they, and, they might have not wanted to take the financial hit without making sure it's going to stick, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, but that's literally... It just hasn't been a thing in the last 15 years. Like, since Iron Man, basically, that just hasn't really been a concern, oh, right? No. Um, because having watched it when it was uncertain whether or not we would get a sequel, it felt really incomplete. And I feel like I personally judged it a little more harshly knowing that. If they had been like, well, you're going to get part two in six months, I'd have been like, put it in my veins. Just, just let's, okay, let's get to part two. I definitely want to see part two. I don't want to have to wait two years to see it, which is what we're going to have to do now. But. Yeah, that's a good point. I feel, I feel, I feel like this one doesn't really stand on its own. And I don't know why they wouldn't have greenlit and made a second part at the same time. Because this movie doesn't, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't really stand on its own. It's all set up for the next one. Um, is is the the narrative, the story it tells? Is it kind of, is there enough there to call it a complete narrative at least? Like, does it have some semblance of art I mean, or beginning, middle, and end? I mean, yeah, definitely. It's it, yeah, mostly. Um, I, no one really has a complete arc, really. I mean, there's a reason why this is where the, the two, your 2000 miniseries ended at the same point, right? It's, it's very much the end of Act 1. And at the end of this act, Paul has to make a choice, and he makes that choice, and the movie ends. It ends really abruptly, too. Like, it's a pretty natural spot for it to stop, but it also it pretty much just stops. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but again, like... All this aside, now that we know part two is coming, I feel like if part two, again, if part two had been already greenlit when I watched it, I would have been a little more forgiving. And I still honestly can't wait to see part two. It's one of those things where I feel like if they get part two right and they tell the back half of Dune right, then watching Mm. them together would be a hell of a thing. Yeah. Because make no mistake, this movie is fucking gorgeous. Yeah, that's... Like, That's they have the thrown key. all the money at this movie. The world is created. I have some minor quibbles about some of the production design choices, but, like, right. the casting is completely on point. The yeah. effects are photo real. Like, mm-hmm. there are flying ships on Dune called, called Thopters, which look like dragonflies. And when they are flying around the planet, you would... I they look real. They just look like mm-hmm. a helicopter would look flying on Earth. But they look like dragonflies, complete with six wings that beat, you know? like. I mean, that's that's Villeneuve's thing, isn't it? I mean, everything Arrival, Blade Runner, 
was so visually incredible and gorgeous and distinctive. Yeah. That's the main draw for watching this for me. Yeah. And, you know, my, my complaints are pretty minor. My complaints are that, like, it's a little bit too austere at times. You know, like, the saturation is cranked way down, which is a trend that I just don't understand in modern cinema. You know, mm-hmm. like, the in, in the narrative of the book, the Atreides' house color is green and the Harkonnens is, are red. And in this movie, they are tan and black. <laughs> And there's yeah, a where, where and those, there's like, and then and the and the emperor's forces are white. <laughs> it's, it's like right. the uniform colors, and there's one flash forward to where we see like the main cultural group on Dune, the Fremen, and their color is mm-hmm. desaturated gold. You know, like it's pfft. that's disappointing. Like, why out of all the color choices you could use? Yeah, I don't get the desaturation thing. I don't get why it's a thing. Um, yeah. Because there's so much room for so much color, especially in this world yeah. that's meant to be so heavily based on old style feudal systems and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where people distinguish themselves with, mm-hmm. you know, like it used to be in, in the olden times, you know, the the kings of, of England, their color was, there was purple because it was a mm-hmm. hard color to make yeah. <laughs> and it was bright and flamboyant. And this doesn't have any of that. I really wish that it did. I mean, I do, that's the thing we've talked about a lot, especially in terms of Marvel movies and DC movies. It's the the scrubbing of colour. When I bought, I've recently bought Flash Gordon on DVD and um, just just pops. It pops Mm -hmm. so good. The DVD transfer is fantastic. I've never seen it look so clear. Because I've only, like Flash Gordon's one of those movies that we would record off TV when we were young and watch it on VHS until the tape snapped. So for me, when, when I realized that my memory of Flash Gordon is like this super fuzzy, you know, not quite tracked with a little bar at the bottom. And so to watch Flash Gordon clean and clear is mm-hmm. like, it's amazing. And it's this beautiful thing. And, and so many movies have this desaturated tone that is just so flat. And I, 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 I'm sure at some point color will come back because it has to, right? God, I hope so. <laughs> so that's disappointing, but still, I do, I do want to see it. Like the and the acting is good, the script is good. Like all, I mean, all the other bits. Again, like everyone, everyone is well cast. The script is good. The real standout is Jason Momoa for me, right. um, because his character Duncan Idaho is the only one that gets to be a little bit flamboyant, a little bit fiery. He's, you know, he's the sword master of House Atreides. He's the advanced scout to Dune when they make the transfer over there. And he's he's the dynamic one. He's the charismatic. He's the only one that isn't like, you know, a group of, you know, British army colonels standing in a circle being like, I say, <laughs> difficult planet. And meanwhile, he's up to the side being like, these guys fight like demons. They're awesome. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> I mean, Momo can just turn up and read a, a shopping list and just be awesome doing it. Like, he, there's not much. Everything he touches seems to come turn out better because of it. So yeah, I mean, he seems to really just enjoy what he does. Um, and the uh, the one, and this is like a, just a personal note. So again, previous versions, even the six hour miniseries from the two thousand, definitely has to make some choices about stuff to leave out and what stuff to leave in. And one of the characters who's always gotten the short shift short shrift in, in this in adaptation is Duncan Idaho. And in this one you get to see his entire story, which I was quite thankful for because Jason Momo is quite good, but also because he's, you know, a sword master and you get to see him kill the shit out of a bunch of bad guys a bunch of times and those scenes the action scenes in this movie are all great but those ones are standout and spectacular Um, because you know the other thing Jason Momoa is really good at apparently is stage combat (laughs) yeah yeah I believe that too so is this a recommend like where are where are we at this like if you're going beyond like of course go see it we've already talked about we're going to go see it on IMAX so it's definitely a visual thing Um, but Beyond, like, 
the visuals. Is this a recommend? I mean, so yes. Um, the, the thing, and I said this in my review as well, is that despite all of the problems that I have with it, and if you really want to boil it down to the, my main problem, it's that I just didn't connect with any kind of like emotional core to the story. Mm-hmm. I do seem to be in a bit of a minority on that front, to be perfectly fair. Lots mm-hmm. of people are really enjoying this movie. But to me, I think it's a gorgeous film that's worth seeing for the production design alone that I didn't really connect with in any more meaningful way. Did you know before you went in that it was only this first part of the book? Yes. It's been like a thing they talked about since since it went into production, that it was only, you know, that his plan has always been to make at least two movies. Right. Um, so... One of my main is- things going in was trying to guess what what point I thought it was going to end. Right, Because um, right. there's like, again, there's a few sort of natural spots where it could end. Uh, and do you think knowing that maybe influenced your feelings about it, knowing that it's just this first half or first third by the sounds of it? I mean, from, I mean, just like I said before, yes, I think it might have, you know, mm-hmm. especially because that second part wasn't greenlit at the time that yeah. I watched it. So this leads to the question is, I, I don't remember. Tell me, what was the, the gap between Infinity War and Endgame? In One year. Release? One year. Yeah. Because I like, if I remember but, right, but also, I, I made... Sorry, I mean, I so... Made me <laughs> you go, you go. You go. No, you I, go. Just want to say, I'm, I like going back to what you were saying about 20 minutes ago about sequels being released quickly i really like when that happens and if if i remember rightly back to the future two and three I only had a couple of months between them and i really really like that because mm-hmm. when you watch a movie that's like this sounds like it feels like the first part knowing the other one is coming quickly is it makes me forgive a lot of the sort of sequel baiting but, but two years is is way too long I would have been happy if the two Infinity, if the, those two Marvel uh, bookends came out within like a month of each other. I think I would have been happier because the, it felt like it was really incomplete, the first one. But go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, so to your point, yeah, Back to the Future Part 2 came out November 89 and Part 3 came out spring 1990, if memory serves. Yeah. Uh, and like, same deal, The Matrix... And Matrix, Re- Matrix Reloaded That's and Revolutions right. were like yeah. spring and fall of the same yeah, year, I think right. 2003, 2004. Yeah. Um, and The Matrix Revolu- or Reloaded is also a movie that ends somewhat abruptly on a pretty big mm-hmm. story point, but you knew the second part was coming in six months, mm-hmm. right? And I, like I, th- I think, again, I think that not that because this one feels like set up for a sequel that at the time that I watched it wasn't a certainty. Mm-hmm. It, it colored my, uh, my opinion mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. But again, also part of that is that the character of Paul Atreides is an interesting one and a, a, an interesting and dynamic one. And it's a metaphor. He can be a metaphor for so many things. And in the novels, the following novels, especially you know, there's some criticism about this movie that it's just another white savior movie, but the rest of the novels make it clear that like they actually deconstruct that pretty thoroughly. <laughs> like, oh, is it is it a chosen one narrative? So it is, but I mean, you haven't read any of the books or anything, but not to spoil mm-hmm. it, I but um, in the novels. By the end of the second novel, which is called Dune Messiah. So the the end of Dune, Paul has won. He he goes in the desert, he finds the Fre- the Fremen, the people who live on Dune, he becomes their leader, he overthrows the Emperor, and a religion is founded largely at the behest of his mother and the order of the Bene Gesserit order that she belongs to. Mm-hmm. A religion is formed around him as a savior, as like a messiah to the people. And the end of the second book has him literally rip his own eyes out and wander into the desert in remorse for having created this religion <laughs> for having played what? a part in creating this religion yeah like it's it's a so thing it is a, 
It's a total deconstruction of that. Then. Yeah. So Ooh, the first that's one. That's interesting. Yeah, and I mean. I've read somewhere that Denny Villeneuve actually wants to make three movies where it'd be like the first one and second one or the first and second halves of Dune and the third one is Dune Messiah, which would be very easy because Dune Messiah is the lightest of all the books. It's super short to the point where when the Sci-Fi <laughs> Channel made a second Dune miniseries, they adapted Dune Messiah and the third book, Children of Dune, and Dune Messiah was just the first part of that miniseries, like just the first episode. Uh-huh. It's super short. Yeah. Um. But like, I just, yeah, here's, again, here's the thing. I did not really connect with this movie in any kind of like meaningful or emotional way, but I also can't wait to see more of it. <laughs> you know, because like of I, the visuals or? because of the visuals and also because I know that most of the stuff that's going to be super interesting happens mm-hmm. in the next book <laughs> right? or happens in the next two thirds of this book, I should say. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's difficult to what, um, to yeah, speak without makes... too many spoilers but it's you know it's a it's is a it a thing. spoiler if you tell if you tell us why what makes him chosen like is it his blood uh, did he find a mythical shell given to him by the ocean that's more oh, okay so at this <laughs> point at this point in the in the podcast dear readers i'm going to oh, invite so simon nice. to ask me a number of questions about this to see how much he's willing to have spoiled. If you've never read Dune, if you've never seen the 1984 David Lynch version, if you've never watched the year 2000 science sci-fi channel miniseries version, this is your invitation to pause and maybe come back later after you've seen any of that or read the books. Um, So I'd like to thank you for listening. I'd like to invite (laughs) you to go to awesome, awesome Friday.ca and, and, uh, you know, if you feel like reading more content or supporting us uh, directly or indirectly, all the links you might need to do that are on the website, awesomefriday.ca. We have a Patreon, a Kofi, and a PayPal. And we love you. We do. Yeah. And now Simon is going to ask me questions, and I'm going to answer them as frankly as I can, starting in after he picks up the thing he just dropped. I just headbutted my lamp and it fell off. Okay. <clears throat> and ready. three and two and one and Spoilerton. New Spoilerton so, City. So, Matthew, you mentioned that Timothy Shamalaba Ding Dong is a chosen one. Um, and what exactly would you say defines one as being chosen? Okay, so I have a question I need to ask you. What level yeah. of spoilers are you willing to accept? Do you want I me to am... stick strictly to the narrative of Dune the novel or to the entire... Um, franchise of novels i I don't honestly you can just go for it because my life is such a whirlwind at the moment i don't know when i'm going to be able to watch this so just go for it just tell me give me the goods duke leto atreides has a concubine named jessica jessica in this film is played (laughs) by rebecca is played by (laughs) rebecca ferguson out of all the sentences i was expecting you to come out with it was like so he has a concubine (laughs) yeah okay I mean, there's a whole joke you can make about, like, you know, hey, Frank Herbert, what are you going to call the the houses the, of your distant, far-flung future? Harkonnen and Atreides. Yeah, great, amazing. That sounds futuristic and weird. And what are you going to call the father figures? Oh, Vladimir and Leto. Yeah, those are old-timey names that feel futuristic as well. <laughs> what are you going to call your hero? Paul. <laughs> like, and, anyway. And you need someone called Jessica. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, okay. uh, Jessica is a member of an order, a religious order, an order of, in the novels, they're referred to as witches, but they are called the Bene Gesserit, and they are an order of women who have all kinds of weird shit going on, but one of their main functions in the Dune universe is they have been, behind the scenes, manipulating the human bloodlines to try and create a supreme being, and a supreme being called the Kwisatz Haderach. <laughs> it's it's like eight Bless different you. ways to pronounce it. Um, within the novel, yeah. One thing that's important to to note about this is that the Bene Gesserit women have complete control over their physiology. And Jessica was told when she became Duke Leto's concubine to only only have girls because they wanted to wed 
an Atreides girl to a Harkonnen boy to create the Kwisatz Haderach. And then Jessica, because she loves Leto so much, has a boy. And Paul becomes the Kwisatz Haderach. He's literally bred to be a chosen, a chosen one. He's literally bred to be a, a superior being. And within the novel of Dune, there's a choice he has to make at one point um, to undergo a ritual that basically opens his mind up to the entire genetic memory of the human race, which is what Reverend Mothers within within the Bene Gesserit order, they go through this ritual and they, they attain um, a portion of this, but there's an area in that genetic memory, that other memory that they cannot access, that only a male can, and Paul is that person. This has suddenly got substantially deeper than I was expecting. Okay. I, I, I was not kidding before when I said that this is a very dense book. So, like to go to go back to that okay. question you asked earlier about that guy who was like, "There's technology, but no computers." Within the narrative of Dune, the year, the reason it's the year ten thousand one ninety one is that it's ten thousand years after. A universe encompassing war called the Butlerian Jihad, where humanity fought a war against artificial intelligences and won and outlawed any kind of thinking machine. And there's a whole order of people called Mentats who are basically living computers. They're people who have trained their brain to be computers, basically. So we don't. The Dune universe doesn't have computers. It has people who think good. <laughs> like, like there's, there's, there's no. They have space travel, but they have space travel via people with, like, again, Mentats are basically human computers. There's no machines, no thinking machines are allowed. That's really interesting, actually. It is. I actually want to read the book, which I was not expecting. And, like, as I said, like, it's one of those things where the more of these things I explain to you, the more you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Because, like, mm-hmm. again, the stuff all became very influential. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a whole other group within Dune called the Beni Tleilax. I can never pronounce it. Um, or the Tleilaxu, who this are... from your memory, is it? Yeah. Well, I also I kind of watched the miniseries a couple of days ago. Um <laughs> Uh, but the Telaxu are this other group within the universe of Dune who are very secretive, but they actually make machines. Not, And they, they often, at least at the point of the Dune novel, they often come close to, but not quite making thinking machines. And they also make clones, which they call Golas. And there's a whole, like it just gets, it gets so expansive. Like there's so much going on. Case in point, the Emperor, the... Shaddam the Fourth, the Padishah Emperor of the Known Universe, who's a pretty major character in the book, at least in the background, does not appear in this movie, even though he's there. You know, he's the one who commands that the Atreides take over stewardship of the planet Arrakis. So is he just not important, or are they just no? He's him? he's very important. Like Paul literally has to overthrow him at the end of the novel, so it's he's not an unimportant character. There's also so part of the the Harkonnens, and I didn't talk about this, but Baron Harkonnen is played by Stellan Skarsgård, and he is actually also spectacular. Oh. And he's this he's in this like enormous prosthetic fat suit because the the whole within the narrative the uh, the Baron is this gluttonous, huge, obese man to the point where he can't actually walk. He has these suspensors implanted in his body, so he sort of floats around, <laughs> which is a very cool visual. And he doesn't have any children, but he has two nephews. And they're both important in the book, but only one of them appears in this movie. The second one, I assume we'll find out who's playing them in the next movie. Because the second one becomes a very important character as well. But the second one's just... Fade is just not in this movie. It's, and you know, there's... Is, is there a, uh, like a hole where he should be in the story, do you think? To be fair, no. Not really. Like, I don't think it's necessarily a bad choice to not mm-hmm. have shown him yet. Um, but I feel like if they had made these movies in one large production, we would have had at least one. We would have been introduced to him, at least. Right. So that when he showed up in the second movie, we wouldn't need to be introduced to him then. Right? Okay. So um, I got a question about the witches. Are they protagonists or antagonists? Are they secretly evil? An evil cabal of witches? They're sort of neither and both. <laughs> of course they are. 
like the the protagonists of this book are is Paul, Paul Atreides, and House Atreides, okay. and everyone who remains loyal to him. The whole thing in the novel is that his father is like basically the only. I mean, to be fair, we don't meet all of the great houses. We really only ever meet the Atreides and the Harkonnen. But Leto is a good man and a good ruler. Values human life. And the Harkonnens are exploitative and murderous and terrible. And all they care about is power and being in charge and money. You know, they're kind of the pretty classic good and bad guys. Right. So when Paul is in charge in, in the second half of the story, he gathers these people to him. He learned, he's learned from his father how to first off, how to gain the trust of new people, but also several of the sort of key players from his father's court come back to his side as well. So it's a, it's a whole thing. And Dave Bautista the key, is the leader of the baddies. He's the Baron Harkonnen's, nephew raban the beast raban <laughs> he's one of the two nephews right okay oh right okay you didn't tell me david desmalchian is in this yep david desmalchian plays piter devries De De mm -hmm. he's the baron harkonnen's mentat thinking and... thinking thinking computer person oh well that's well cast. he's i mean to be fair he's great he's yeah. really great um so I mean, yeah, like, and to answer your earlier question, like, how do they, how do they do interstellar travel? <laughs> yeah, I want to know. Do they rub some of the spice on like a rack of ribs and wake up and they're on a different planet? Uh, if only it were that simple. No, long term exposure to the spice. So there's the spacing guild. Uh, the spacing guild has a monopoly on interstellar travel. They're the only people who can do it, and the way they do it is that there are guild navigators who have been so exposed to the spice because the spice gets you high and grants limited prescience and expanded consciousness and it's never the mechanics of it are never really explained but um because they've had so much exposure to spice they've become mutated and they are unable to even breathe in normal oxygen atmospheres and they are able to consume spice and then fold space time <laughs> so oh. It's not like a warp speed thing. It's they literally like the way that the the guild ships work in Dune is that the spacing guild operates these highliners, which are just enormous ships that basically stay in orbit above a planet. And when someone wants to go somewhere, like say relocate an entire noble house from one planet to another, that noble house will just take all their own little ships and park them inside the highliner. And then a spacing guild navigator will basically fold space so that rather than like traveling through space it literally just folds space and the mm -hmm. highlighter ends up in the second spot and is that a good visual in the movie is that done well it's actually really interesting in the movie the highlighters are basically this big tube <laughs> i actually think it's a really interesting choice a really good choice the the highlighters in this movie are a huge tube so huge you can see it from the surface of the planet and the way you travel through space time is you just fly your ship through it <laughs> and you okay. come out on the other end where you want to be and it like it's not really explained it doesn't need to be explained but it's a really cool mm. visual and there's not like any special effects it literally just a ship goes in one end and, at one planet and comes out the other end at another planet and i kind of like that yeah cool well that sounds really much more in depth than i was than i got from the trailer and it's it's very interesting now you've you've touched on this already but everything that you're describing uh, I had to look up when Dune was published because I can hear parts of so many books I've read and so many movies I've seen that use elements of what you're describing. It is and influential in the same way that like every fantasy story you've read since the 30s has basically used the same elves that Tolkien used. <laughs> you know, like it fundamentally changed some of the ways we think about science fiction. Mm. I should probably read it then. Yeah. And that we haven't even honestly talked about the sandworms. And the sandworms in this movie, to be fair, are exquisite and magnificent. Are they literally just worms under the sand? Like local local wildlife? Watch out for the sandworms? Don't piss them off? Yeah, except for that, you know, a full-size sandworm is 400 meters long. 
Okay. And 80 meters across, like in diameter. <laughs> Um, and I said this in my, my review as well. So I've, I refuse to sit in a D box seat, which for mm-hmm. those of you who don't know, D box at Cineplex are the ones where they like rumble mm-hmm. and shake. Um, uh, but I was in the row that was one ahead of the D box seats this time. And when the sandworm went by those, she- those seats shook and for the first time ever, it felt appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Because the sandworms are meant are like massive, right? like completely yeah. massive and in, in it's it's hard to like work this kind of level of detail into a movie or a series or whatever but like within the the world of dune there's no way to kill a sandworm right <laughs> like a, yeah. in the books they're described as being like made out of segments and if you were to say cut one in half the two segments would just keep living mm-hmm. um they're just, they're highly allergic to water, but they live on a desert planet. There's no water. And even if there was, there wouldn't be enough to kill a 400 meter long, 80 meter across sandworm. So. And are they story relevant or are they just a danger to be avoided? In the, uh, movie, in the movie. It's so nothing about them is really explained in the movie, but within, within the world of Dune, you find out pretty quickly that the spice comes from the worms. Oh, uh, there it the, is. The spice is a byproduct of the life cycle of the worm. Okay. So, um, but no one really knows that. Because the interesting thing, and it's actually one of my very minor complaints about the novel of Dune, is that, so, there's this substance that enables longer life and expanded consciousness and enables interstellar travel, and it isn't the capital of the Empire. The one place where you can get this mm. isn't the capital <laughs> isn't guarded by like a million people isn't yeah. you know and you don't like it's not a well-known fact how the spice even where it even comes from until after the first novel <laughs> like, like it feels like something that like somebody so there's something i'm sure there's like an universe explanation mm. to do with communication and how the fremen deal with stewardship of arrakis but like it's always felt a bit weird that the emperor didn't just maintain a presence on Arrakis. You know? Yeah, you would have thought that'd be his number one hope the spot, unless he really hates sand because it gets everywhere and it's and it's coarse and yeah, it's coarse. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I mean, I do want to see the movie, but now I really quite want to read the book too. So mission accomplished. Yeah, I don't feel I don't feel anything's been too majorly spoiled as well. Sounds actually really interesting. I, well, I, as I on time to read something again so that sounds good. well and and as with any great influential work there's only so much you could actually spoil because so much of it has been you know it's influenced so many other things so many of the elements of dune have been taken and done again in other stories because it is so mm-hmm. influential mm-hmm. okay i got a question for you then what is the best denis villeneuve film it's a tough question. So it's not this? It's not this. I did not connect with this in the way that I wanted to, but it's still hard to fall to the level of scope and ambition that it entails, which is why mm-hmm. I think I'd recommend people still see it. Um, but we're talking about a person who's made... I mean, Arrival is a five, a 5 out of 5 for me. Mm-hmm. Blade Runner 2049 is a 5 out of 5 for me. Sicario is a 5 out of 5 mm-hmm. for me. One of his early Canadian works, Incendies, is a 5 out of 5 for me. Like, the man hasn't really made a bad movie. He's made one movie I haven't really connected with, but he hasn't really made a bad movie, right? Uh, end of Watch. I, no. I'm... What? Did he make End of Watch? The no. Jake Gyllenhaal? No, he made a movie called Enemy. Oh, cool. Enemy with uh... oh, enemy's fantastic. I thought he did the Jake Gyllenhaal cop thing with the shaved head. End of watch with my no, opinion. no, that's um somebody else. Oh, okay, um, uh, enemy's no, fantastic. With Jake Gyllenhaal, he did a movie called Enemy right after he did another movie with Jake Gyllenhaal called Prisoners, which yeah. is also a very good movie. Mm-hmm. Um. With a really difficult question. One thing I really like about Villeneuve's movies is they don't they don't end clean. Almost never end clean, right? Mm-hmm. Like 
uh, there's a whole moment. I don't know if you've seen Prisoners, but like there's a whole move, oh. moment at the end that is one of those movie endings where I feel like you know how people miss the point of the ending of Inception. Mm-hmm. You know, people focus on whether or not mm-hmm. he's in the real world or not, but the actual point is that he's accepted his reality. So there's mm-hmm. a question kind of like that at the end of Prisoners that I feel a lot of people miss the point of. Um, mm-hmm. That is just it's also just very like emotionally rending question that the narrative asks of you it's uh, <laughs> that movie also deconstructs the myth of like you know the american father as hero you know mm-hmm. there's so many narratives where like a child is in danger and the father rushes off and saves the day and in this movie the father rushes off and makes everything a thousand times worse <laughs> it's uh he makes question. He makes movies that ask questions that I appreciate. Don't have easy answers, especially the end of Enemy. Like without spoiling what that is, like yeah, there is no way when you watch Enemy, and I really suggest you do. There is no possible way you will ever guess the last shot of that movie. Mm-hmm. Like yep, it's impossible, and and yet it works. It's really something. And and I mean, Arrival is interesting in that it it does the same thing at the end where it pulls every rug out from under you and throws this horrible truth at you. But it it works for the end of that movie. Like it ties up that it has a conclusion, but it doesn't feel like Dune feels like it has like a conclusion. Really, is I mean, it is, it's a, it's a conclusion of the first act of the story, right? <laughs> So yes, yeah, okay, yeah. Anyway, well, so we've been we've been rambling about this for quite a while. <laughs> I recommend, as a person who didn't connect with it, I can say that I am also in the minority. This movie's trending really well on all the review sites, um, and I mean, on visuals alone, yeah, definitely watch it. And if you can see it on a huge ass screen, if it's safe where you are, definitely do that. Like it mm-hmm. is very beautiful to look at. Um. Yeah, Re- I mean, recommended. It's still recommended. It's. I didn't think it was amazing, but I, I didn't think the narrative was amazing, but I thought it, almost everything else about it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I look forward to it. I'm still yeah. blown away by those early trailers. Like completely, I just want to see visually. I just want to see like a major swing, high budget sci-fi. Yeah. And that's fair. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, it doesn't, it's not the best thing that it is effectively, you know, the prologue to the Lord of the Rings Mm -hmm. at the beginning of those movies, there's that like 15 minute section where it just like gives you the history of the ring. Uh, Mm -hmm. This movie is basically that, but two and a half hours long (laughs) in terms of, uh, you know, like it's all set up. It's all set. It's not a, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's all set up. And I I honestly, as much as I didn't connect with this one, I cannot wait to see more. Mm-hmm. Like I definitely That's want funny. to see more. It's a good sign. Um, in the same way that like when the two Matrix movies came out, like I was not satisfied by the ending of the Matrix Reloaded, mm-hmm. but it made me want to watch the Matrix Revolutions. Like mm-hmm. I wanted it immediately because yeah. it was they were two halves of one story, and this is one yeah. half of the story, and. You know, for better or for worse, if the second one is good, it'll probably redeem the first one in my eyes a little bit. And Mm -hmm. because, again, it will have been the first half of that whole story. And once Mm -hmm. you see the end of the story, it'll be easier to judge. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Your reframer in your head is two parts of the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Similar. It's kind of of like how um, Alien Covenant made me think better of Prometheus because of where it goes with the characters and the intent. Yeah, I'm. I, I that's a stretch too far for me. I think it would take a lot more than uh, I quite like Alien Covenant, uh, but it did nothing to change my opinion of Prometheus, which I did not like at all. Uh yeah. But, I mean, I think I like Prometheus more than you in the first place, but yes, that's a whole, that's yes, another that's episode. True. That's another no, episode really entirely. Is. Oh my god, let's talk about Ridley Scott's approach to Alien on another yeah. episode. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. I want to watch Dune. Thank you for your Dune information. You're welcome. Uh, and, uh, what are we talking about next week? Do you, what do you have on the cards apart from everything else in your life right now? I honestly don't. I know that we will have 
Cowboy Bebop to talk about in two weeks. Yes. Uh, I honestly don't know what we'll have to talk about on the podcast mm-hmm. next week. I know that I have a ton of stuff to watch. I just don't know which stuff we yes. will both be able to talk about. <laughs> well, it might just be me asking you questions again, because I move on Saturday, so I'll be unboxing stuff. Oh, yeah. can we talk... The thing we're seeing on Wednesday, can we talk about that? Yes. Uh, so actually, t- yes, there's two things we'll be able to talk about next week. Um, one of which... I mean, the embargo has already dropped, so we're going to see Eternals a couple of days ahead of its release, and we will also have uh, be seeing a this is the movie review. The review embargo on this one's also already dropped, but um, we will have seen. I hope we'll both have seen the new Netflix movie Passing, which is oh no, I do want to watch that. Yeah. Um, which is a Rebecca Hall, ac- the actress Rebecca Hall's directorial debut, and it's based on a very famous American novella from the twenties about two uh, African American women, one of whom is passing for white in the twenties. Mm-hmm. It's uh, and uh, so we should have, if all goes to plan, <laughs> uh, we will have mm-hmm. both of those to talk about next week, and then we'll have Cowboy Bebop and something else the week after, assuming everything goes to plan. Yeah, those eternal reviews, man. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't I haven't engaged with it, but I right. I've seen I've seen the Coles notes and I refuse to engage yeah. until I've seen it myself. Okay, fair enough. All yeah. right. Well let's draw a line under it there then. And um thank you for listening. And if you haven't got the message already, please give Matt some money via Patreon so he can do his thing. Yeah. Just visit us at awesomefriday.ca. Hell, if you go to awesomefriday.ca, turn off your ad blocker and click on on an ad, I'll be your best friend forever. <laughs> Is that all it takes? No, it's not all it takes, but it goes a long way. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, thank you for listening, listeners. It's been our pleasure again. Indeed, um, we will hope you enjoy Dune when you see it. I hope you enjoy Army of Thieves when you see it. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Have a lovely day. Bye. Bye. Bye.